Okay, let's begin our first malacha. Come a long way to be here. And that can be found on page nine of your books. I'm planning, God willing, today to do three malachot, all being well. <coughs> not very difficult ones, not too complicated, but some important halachic implications of all of them. Number one, choresh, plowing. We have started the first of 11 of Sduri Hapas. It is the order of bread. Why order of bread? Well, actually, two opinions. Rashi says this first one of Choresh and the other nine that go after it are related to plowing the earth in order to prepare the earth for seeding. And when the seeds sprouted, they were reaped, after which they were crushed and turned into um, dyes. Because dyes come from plants, right? D Y E. Um, Rav Haigaon disagrees with this and says, no, these 11. Uh, don't, that happened in the Mishkan, but these 11 are the uh, one of the first of the 11 stages in terms of making bread because we had Lechem Hapanim in the Mishkan, the 11, uh, the 12 show breads that were both? in the Mishkan. Could it be both? It could be both. It could be both. Actually, it's purely academic, so I'm not going to go into it. In the end, the answer is you can't do it. But what can you not do? So let's have a look. So Choresh, which is to plow. Any Persians here? Do you speak Persian? You know what Choresh is? What's Choresh? Stew. Stew. All right, what do you always have it with? Rice. Yes. Palau. Ah, oh, yeah. I like that. Okay, all those are not Persian, please marry one. Okay, let's go. I'm only joking. Kind of. Okay, so fine. So the Av Malachat, so that's basically the source of the background, okay? Basically herbs, or maybe the, um, the, the, the ground was prepared. So basically anything you're gonna do in terms of increasing the agricultural capacity of soil in a positive way. Okay, it's gotta be positive. It could be doing it negatively. Negatively would not do something. We'll see later on that negatively affecting the soil is not gonna be a problem. For example, actually, I'll mention it right now, if a person wants to urinate on the ground, right? Well, now we have indoor plumbing, but for many, many years, we did not have indoor plumbing, and people would have to relieve themselves outdoors. They didn't have to find a finished surface, right? They were allowed to urinate on the earth. One second, but I'm, you know, increasing the capacity of the earth. And the answer is that wasn't a problem because the urine itself is more detrimental to earth, I read, <coughs> um, than uh, plain water. Okay, so basically we're saying something's going to actively and positively affect the potential of the soil to produce uh, plants. So that's going to include plowing and digging and hoeing and raking and fertilizing and even adding soil itself is going to be uh, the problem. That's going to be the of. Okay, the of is actually positively changing it. Okay, so if, that, if those are the avos, what exactly are the toldos? So the toldos are going to be things which aren't actually plowing, but are still making the earth better. Okay, and one example of this is on the board behind me, and that is mesakel. Mesakel is to basically remove debris things you don't want, things that make the soil not so effective to produce, like twigs and stones and such things. All those items are moksa. In addition to that, you're also doing a tolder by picking up a stone off the soil, pick up a twig, pick up a branch, anything like that is going to uh, breaking up soil. Okay? Uh, all of that is going to be problematic when it comes to this malacha. As well as that, we mentioned already, dragging a heavy object across the so soft soil, right? If you know for sure it's going to make a groove, even though that's your intention, it's the block into the gufa, we still don't uh, do that either, okay? So any soil, whether it's your soil or someone else's soil, is going to be included in this. Adding to this, and this is going to have a lot of repercussions as we're going to see, mashvegumos, which means to flatten the earth, just to flatten it, which means if a person sees there's a little hole in the ground, like, oh, I don't like that, so they kick a bit of soil into it, or there's a bit of a lump on their soil, and they're going to squish it with their foot in order to flatten it so the earth is flatter, that's also going to be a problem. So if anyone here watches polo, you know, like polo watchers here, that's a good Jewish game, isn't it? Like, polo, like the horses, yes. Do you know what they do at the end of polo match? 
Don't watch polo? No, no polo, no royalty here. So known as the royal sport, all right, because it's very expensive. So after the game, what do they do, anyone know? They walk onto the, onto the earth and they return all the divots, all the bit of earth that came out, all the, because they got knocked out, so they put it back in. Polo is not a Shabbos game. It's also not much of a Jewish game either, to be perfectly honest with you, but it's not a Shabbos game. Basically, going there and flattening the earth is going to be problematic, okay? So all of that is going to be an issue. If you have earth that cannot, uh, is not arable land, cannot produce plants, for example, sand, that would be less of a problem. Because sand doesn't actually, you can't actually grow anything in sand itself. If the sand is wet, then it's problematic. But stum sand, right, that would be lesser of a problem. If, for example, now sand is probably muksa, but if it's designated before Shabbos, and say like, this sand is dry, and I want to have my kids play with it on Shabbos, actually it's gonna be okay. So if you have a sandbox, kids still have that? When I grew up we had a sandbox. That would be okay, because you don't really grow stuff in the sand itself, okay? Absolutely, you can walk on the beach, but there is yes, you can. Also on the wet side. Also on the wet side. Why? Because first of all, you're not plowing. Okay. Second of all, actually working the soil will be a problem when it's wet. But stop walking on it is not choresh because it's ketisha, right? We said. Oh, related to this. Thanks for reminding me. You can actually wheel strollers or push wheelchairs over regular ground earth as well, even your own earth. Right, because you're not actually digging a groove, you are, it's katisha, you are compressing it. It's like a, like a roller going over the ground. So that actually uh, would be permitted. Sand is the same thing. Even if you were to make a imprint of the tr tire track or the bottom of your shoe, we said already, it's not gonna be a problem, so you can walk on it. However, you should know that a beach is a caramelit. What's a caramelit? Caramelis. Caramelis or caramel, anybody know? So we have four domains when it comes to Hutsa'a carrying on Shabbat. We have Rashuta Rabim, which is the public domain that thousands of they discuss exactly what it means, but thousands of people walk through. It's at least, uh, I think, 16 amot across. It's a large area. That Times Square, you cannot carry in such an area. Then you have Rashuta Yachir, a private domain. That's your own house. Or where you can carry, or a building, you can carry inside it. Then you have some called a caramelit. A caramelit is basically neither of those. It's not a private domain, it's open, but it's not an, that thousand people are passing through it. Right? The beach and the ocean are caramelit. It's rabbinically forbidden to carry in such an area. So you could walk on it, but you can't carry something with you on a beach. Okay? And the other place is a makum pator, which is a small depression in the ground, or a, an object up on the ground, which has a certain minimum area, uh, which does not fall under this. I mentioned this as a side point, because you can't carry on a beach in Shabbos, there's no Eruv. The Eruv can turn a caramelit, however, into a Shutta Yachid. That's what an Eruv does. Yes? So, what if the beach has an Eruv around it? It's unlikely that right next to the water, there is an Eruv around it. I am not aware of any such beach, maybe right up to, you know, near the water, but, um, which could be. Okay. It yeah, could be. Oh, the um, far off, they put it right on the uh, on the broad walk, right on the beach, right on the beach. But it can't go out to the water, because no, it can't be no. there. So at some point, yeah, you can basically, you have to know where it is. You can see like a thin wire, there you'll be able to see it. I mean, we're actually in an area of right now. Can you feel it? No. Um, no, it's a problem, because you said Times Square is not allowed, but what if from 29th to 34th, you have a lot of people? So right, so the question is, right, so that's a very big discussion. And now, here in this particular area, it's not considered enough people, and there was an area that is built. Baishi University and local synagogues actually go down, actually go right down to uh, like 13th Street, and further down even. Okay. Yeah, yes, what? Yeah, that's where you can walk on it. That's where you can walk on it and make a footprint because it's in the Kayem, and basically water's gonna come, it's gonna move it away. But playing in the sand, wet sand, building, building sand castles on Shabbos is prohibited. Yes. Just really quickly, the stroller is allowed. The stroller is allowed, absolutely. That is flattening. You're flattening with a stroller, you're flattening with a wheelchair, you're flattening with your feet, you're flattening with a bicycle even. And therefore you're allowed to do it. What do you say, what's not allowed? 
Flattening is allowed. Flattening is not a problem. It's harisha, it's plowing, digging into the ground is going to be a problem. Even walking with high heels is allowed, even though you're making a hole in the ground. If you go along with a knife and made a hole in the ground, it's a problem. Using your high heel because you're just walking, that's what your kavana, that is permitted. Yes. A makom pator. That is an area which is less than the Lamont, right? Has its own, or like a hole in the ground, right? Has its own uh, status, like a fire hydrant is classically that shape and size. Okay? That's also another area. Basically, when it comes to walking around, you get something in your pocket, you either want to go back to Rosh Yachid, or you want to stick it on a makom pator. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, that flattening gear is, is that like on the board? So that means like filling in earth so that it's like. Flattening, though, if there is gumos, if there are certain holes and certain things, and you start to use your feet or an item just so to it flatten it out, that okay. is a problem. And that's going to be a problem when it comes to sweeping, as we're going to get to in just a second. Uh, wow, a lot of questions today. Okay. Um, uh, you can't spit on soil or rub spit into soil either. Right? Even that little bit of spit is uh, a problem. If you have, like, some stick in the bottom of your shoe, Okay, and you want to just kind of like go up to the soil and rub it off like that. You shouldn't do it onto soil. You can do it onto hard ground, but you can't actually do it onto soil because the effect of it is also going to be flattening the, uh, the earth as well. Okay, so that's... Um... So Mishvagamot is allowed? Mishvagamot is not allowed. So you just go where you I said that you cannot. I said you cannot do it. I'm sorry, I don't want to confuse you. Good, good, good. If you're confused, then I'll be confused as well. Mashva gumat, to flatten the earth, is not allowed. Let me, let's go into this right now. Let's talk about sweeping. Okay, I'll explain mashva gumat better. Um, it used to be in Talmudic times, they said you're not allowed to sweep inside your house. Actually, it wasn't just Talmudic times, the Rishom speak about it. And even the Chofetz Chaim said, you cannot sweep inside your house on Shabbos. Okay? Why do they say this? Because nowadays... We have everything tiled and carpeted and all the rest of it. But if you go back not that long ago into small little rural towns like where the Chavos Chaim lived in Radin, some small town in, uh, in Poland, the inside of the house was basically a, a, bit, a floor, just dirt floor, right? which was hardened, but it was, and it would create dents. Over time, people would walk on it and there would be dents inside your house. That's just the way it was. So they weren't allowed to sweep inside the house because when they did that, they were actually leveling the ground. They were leveling the ground, and that was forbidden. So the later commentator says, fine, but if you live in a town where some houses have tiled floors, which is not a problem, right? There's no bumpiness. It's just a tile. It's, it's not earth. We're dealing with earth over here. Then you can in the house, and they say, well, don't do it in the house, because you'll end up doing another house. Then they turn around and said, you know what? Nowadays, pretty much everyone right, in the Western world has floor coverings of tiles and carpets and wood and whatever it is, and therefore sweeping indoors is permitted. Sweeping indoors is permitted. But if you have earth, floor, or in it, you cannot sweep. Why? Mashva gumot. There are certain holes, and by you sweeping, you're making it better because you're flattening the ground. That's forbidden. Mashva gumot is forbidden. That is not permitted. Okay? Okay, we're going to carry on. Okay, yeah? The difference between mushroom and gumot and carrying a wheelchair over soil is that the first one, you're filling up a hole, but when you're carrying a wheelchair, you're just filling over the ground. Great. The difference between, very, very nice. The difference between putting a wheelchair or a stroller over earth is you're flattening the earth. When you sweep, you're, as in you're just compressing it, not flattening it, compressing it, right? When you sweep it, you're flattening it. Flattening is a problem. Mushroom gumot, that's a problem, right? Because you're improving it. The problem also came around when it comes to outdoor surfaces that are covered, like um, a driveway. Can you sweep a driveway or a deck? So some say, well, you're outdoors, okay, and you're near earth. Once you start sweeping driveways and decks, you're going to start sweeping dirt actually in the ground itself. And some say no. So there, there are differences of opinions. Many people are strict with outdoor <coughs> sweeping as opposed to indoor sweeping okay um what else on this there's more on this okay fine so bare soil is a problem inside the house pretty much everyone accepts you can sweep inside the house 
Outside of fish surf, finished surface is questionable. You have to ask your L O R. Okay. How about flowers and uh, potted plants? So potted plants will give the same degree of strictness as a regular outdoor earth, meaning they are moksa. You cannot move a potted plant around on Shabbat. Right? You may come to start digging, hucking, and squeezing, and all the rest of it. So that you cannot do. Flowers, however, aren't part of this problem because flowers are detached. So flowers are not muksa. You can move them around. Flowers are not muksa. The rabbis, however, said, you know what? We're going to add a stringency over here. When it comes to flowers, you cannot put them into water on Shabbat. You cannot put them into water on Shabbat. As happened to me, I have many guests come to my home, Baruch Hashem. About 90% of them are kind of not observant. And they say, what should you bring? And we always say, don't bring flowers, because they may arrive late. And they just sit on the counter, dying till after Shabbat. Please bring me wine. A nice dry wine, actually. It would be perfect. Just throw it out there if anyone's interested. Um, a fine dry wine. Flowers are a problem. You cannot put them into water on Shabbat. Even though they're disconnected, it's actually rabbinically for, uh, prohibited. It's not on a Torah level because they're not attached to the ground anymore. And all this stuff was attached to the ground. So flowers are not moksa. If fla now, we are strict with flowers if they are open or closed. If they're open, you're like, well, that's as big as they're going to get. Even those you cannot put inside for the first time. However, if your flowers fell and they fell out of the glass jar, on the, uh, out of the vase, or vase, whatever you call it, you can return them if they have blossomed already, if they're already open. They can be returned to water. Okay? You cannot add water, you cannot change the water, but you can put them back into the water that are open. If they're not even blossomed, they're closed buds, I don't think you can even put them back in, to be honest with you. It is a problem. Okay? What did you say about you can't? You cannot. I said a lot of you cannot. Which one do you want to know? No. You can flower, but what you cannot? Plants. Plant, a, a plant. What's uh, different between plant and One plant? is with soil. One, 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 for example, you see many people will put their lulav, right, into water on Yom Tov. That's okay. On Shabbat, you can't do that. On Shabbat, you cannot do it. You can leave it in, and you don't even use the lulav, so it has to be put into the water from before Shabbat, because they want to keep it fresh, okay? Actually, lulav is muksa, by the way, for Shabbat, not for, uh, not for Yom Tov. Finally, playing games. So this is tricky as well. So the rabbis say you cannot play games outside on earth, because mashva gumot, right? If you start to play a game, you start flattening the earth and thereby improving it. So, what games? Games where, like ball games, for example, many people are strict with, and they say that you are. There are those who are lenient with this, but mostly people are careful not to play outdoor ball games uh, on on Shabbat. Indoor, we got the same problem with the sweepings. So we say, you know, it's okay, right? Because you know, what I'm saying, you like it's on a table. Some are strict, but usually people are lenient. Because you're not, you know, it's indoor. On a driveway, you've got the same problem, basically. On a paved surface outdoors, it's questionable, and you have to ask your LOR, your local orthodox rabbi. About that one. Playing kuglach, you know, kuglach or jacks, that's okay because that's not rolling, that's just lifting, right? So that's going to be uh, permitted as well, yeah. Sorry, could you say the reason again? Reason for what? For not playing. Because once again, when you start playing ball, you start to flatter the surface. I used to go to a camp, actually. It was run by, it was a Kirov camp, run by observant Jews for non-observant kids. And they got stuck in that situation. They had to do something with the kids on Shabbat. They permitted outdoor ball games. They were lenient with it. They were lenient with that particular thing for these kids. In other words, because you're not actually digging in. The kids aren't playing on their own soil, right? It's not a psych ratio. Right? It's a block of Israel and they're not getting it. It's the, the low nichle. There's no positive benefit. If they do, it's not their lawn. So they, for those reasons and others, they allowed it. There are times when a person can be lenient with this, right? Playing ball games outside because it's not definite. It's not psychratia. You're going to start planning. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so just a stroller is um is fine. It's not flattening there. Yes, strollers are okay. Push chairs okay. Wheelchairs okay. Even riding a bike is okay. To be honest with you, if your kids are riding bikes over the lawn, right? Young kids, you don't have to stop them really. Yeah. What about like sitting with the picnic on it? Because technically, it's really we're gonna come to that right now. We're gonna come to that. Not right now. Uh, a little bit a few later for code sale we're gonna to come to that the rabbinic descriptions of restrictions of climbing okay we did finish number one are we good questions answered yes no to plants plants are moxie you want to put flowers on your Shabbos table and take them off again on Shabbos that's okay you cannot put a plant right onto your and off your Shabbos table on Shabbat okay we're we clear on that and that's a muxa thing because you actually you may come to oh let's say you have a pot of plant that gets knocked over by the kids which is going to happen Okay, you're allowed to sweep up the soil because you know you have to sit around in dirt and put in the garbage. You can't return it into the pot because you are improving it by putting it back in. So you can't put it back in, but you can sweep it up and just throw it away. Good. Block number one done. Question? Yes. Yeah. So with the rugelach, not rugelach. Rugelach are those delicious things we eat on Shabbos. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kugelach is okay. It is okay. Yes, it is okay. It is, because that's left. You're not dragging it on the ground. You know, it's not affected. Right? You throw it. Could where we are lenient with it. It's that game, you know, the little square things, you catch it, you know, you play the kid, you want to play cookalo for the kids? No? Jacks? You ever play jacks as a kid? Oh my god. Put your iPads away, put your and play a couple of games with your friends. Okay, Zorea is our next malacha, number two. Zorea. So Zorea we translate as seeding, which is pretty simple. We plow the ground and then we put the seed into the ground, okay? So we have our Av Malacha, which is, which is putting uh, any form of seeds Planting, planting a plant, by the way, not necessarily a seed. Even putting like a plant into the ground as well is going to be uh, an issue, right? Putting, um, actually, my daughter did this last Shabbos. She was under Bat Mitzvah. But putting an avocado into water, you know that with the thing and the head thing, you know, plant, you know, do that, right? You ever do that as a kid? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Never grows, by the way. It just like rots over nine weeks and just throws away. But <laughs> maybe works for somebody out there. Anyway, all these things are, are going to be a problem. So here's the question. Here's an interesting question with halakha ramifications, okay, which apply to us. Basically, you should be very careful when you eat seeds or fruits with seeds outside on Shabbos. Okay, you bite an apple, the seed may boop, go out, the pit, right, flies out your mouth eh, and lands in the ground itself. Okay, so the question is, if that were to happen, would you be permitted to lift up the seed? And why would you? Why would you or why wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So the, that question comes down to this very unusual concept, which goes like this. At what point are you violating Zorea? See, I take my seed and I put it in the ground. Have I done Zorea by doing that? No. So yeah. the answer is, it depends who you ask. Some say, everyone agrees you shouldn't do it. But at what point have you transgressed it? Some say, as soon as you put it into the ground, it's done. The action and the Avera, the prohibition, are connected. They are one and the other. But there are those that say something really unusual. They say, actually, you shouldn't do it. But the prohibition of putting the seed in the ground is disconnected from the act itself because by putting a seed in the ground, listen carefully, you haven't actually done anything because it's not sprouting. See, when you plow, you plow, it's done, right? You light a fire, it's done. But I put a seed in the ground, nothing's happened. It's just seed sitting in the ground. When does it begin to become a problem? When it germinates. When does it germinate? Three days later, not before. Which means, if a seed goes into the ground by accident, the people who hold that it takes three days to germinate, which pretty much everyone agrees takes three days before it starts to rot and starts to... Actually, you're not breaking Shabbos to three days later, which is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Monday. 
considering the first day is part of the three. You with me? So actually, by putting a seed in the ground, you're not breaking Shabbos till Monday, three days later. And actually, you break Shabbos <coughs> retroactively, lemafreya, as we say, whereas we actually break Shabbat. Now, why is that important? Because you can't put a seed in the ground anyway. So it's important when it comes to a situation where the seed actually accidentally fell into the ground. Because if it fell into the ground accidentally, maybe I can lift it up. Because if I lift it up, according to those opinions that it doesn't sprout for three days, I'm preventing myself breaking Shabbos in three days' time. Does that make sense? You can pick it up. I didn't say that yet. I said that's the possibility. We have another situation when it comes to seeds and pits on Shabbat, which is muksa. You see, inedible pits and seeds and plants are actually problematic because they are muksa, which means one cannot move them on Shabbat. So if you're in a situation on Shabbat where a seed or a pit accidentally falls into the ground, onto the ground, I'm like, whoa, I haven't broken Shabbos yet. I'm not going to break Shabbos till Monday. So I'm going to pick it up. Wait, wait a second, maybe it's muksa. So things which are inedible, okay, things which are inedible, right, such as raw beans, right, and raw peas, Garden seeds, grass seeds, date pit, peach pits, right? See that? Those are muksa. But things which are not muksa, some say if they fall accidentally on the ground, you should try to pick them up, such as watermelon seeds, apple or um, pear cores, sunflower seeds, right? Who eats sunflower seeds? All Israelis, right, basically. Right? That's, Shabbos. That's like the Shabbos hobby, yeah? Animal fodder if you're on a farm. All those things are edible and have actually, they're not muksa. And therefore, those things you should actually pick up if they fell on the ground accidentally. Ta-da! Yeah. Isn't the, the, the whole act is to plant it, a seed to yeah. have something sprouting. Yeah. So picking it up, being muxa, you're still preventing it from actually, like you're, isn't it better to prevent the actual? That's a very, very good question. is saying, well, listen, the probability over here is something which is like a doraisa, and you're going to do a rabbinic one just to pick it up. And the answer is, even so, we don't, try, this is part of a much bigger discussion, we don't pre- try to prevent other things by doing other they wrote. So if you're here in that situation, I think they would fall under it, and therefore we don't do it. Or we do it after Shabbos. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm like, well, I'm just picking up on Sunday night. Okay. Then it won't be I've never seen anyone walk around Sunday looking for pits on the ground. Probably <laughs> maybe, maybe there are Sadiqim out there no, who are like, with a magnifying glass, I guess. <laughs> Some people don't do outdoor parties because of this, right? Some people will not do, but that's not halachic. Halachically, you can, for sure. Okay, you can even drink, right? Have drinks, so be careful not to spill it. So you can't do a less severe... In order to prevent a bigger one. Yeah. Cool. A reza pass. Learn it out from a cooking bread that started to cook before it fully cooked on Shabbat, removing it beforehand. Yeah. So if it is inedible, right, then it's muksa, and therefore one shouldn't. However, if it is... Um, edible, then it is not muksa, or edible to someone, even animal food, and then it is permitted. Yeah. Yeah. Just very good. The actual act of the seed going into the ground, it could catch, and that's problematic. Not in- indoors, not be a problem. I'm talking on the soil itself. That's enough. That's enough. It could do. It could do. That's enough. Seemingly, that's enough. Okay, we did the sukkah thing in great detail. Remember the sukkah thing? Shlok on top of the sukkah. Right? We said if there's dry soil around the sukkah, if there's water on top, you can't put it directly on, but you can do a form of. Form of. Right? What, 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 what halakhi principle are we relying upon for the sukkah cover? Nope. It was grama, right? Put it onto a place of wood or something, or build your sukkah onto a deck or something, even though it's definitely going to roll off. That was a grama. We said that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh-huh. We did plants. We did vases. Okay. And that's pretty much it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Easy peasy. Lovely. Okay. And putting cut flowers into water, we said. Stems closed and open, that's good. Okay, fine. 15, let's do the next malacha.
with flying today. So this one has a number of other aspects to it. This is Kotzer, right? Kotzer, also known in English as reaping. Reaping, okay? Reaping. So once you have plowed the earth and you planted your seeds, then shoots and trees and grass and vegetables are coming out. And you want to harvest them. Harvest them. We're going to include not just the actual fruit itself, but even a leaf, pulling a leaf from a branch or anything else like this is going to be a problem. So we have our Av Malacha on page 15, the act of severing any part of a plant from its Makom Gidulo, place of growth, by cutting its stem. Okay? Now, although it happened when it came to wheat in the Mishkan, or various things make dyes, we're going to include all fruit, all grains, all vegetables, all branches, even mushrooms. Why would you think not mushrooms? Because they come in the ground, they grow on top of it. Where are, what do you make on a mushroom? Shakol. Why do you make a shakol on a mushroom? Because it's a fungus, that's right. By the way, they call me Mr. Fun um, Mr. Mushroom, you know why? I'm a fun guy to be with. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So um, mushrooms receive the nutrition from the air, right? So you make a shakol on them. And uh, when it comes to Shabbos Allah, however, even pulling mushrooms out of the ground or being included in this, they do get some sustenance from the ground. They're still attached to the ground uh, itself. Okay? So that is our basic malacha of it. We're going to include into this um, plants as well coming out of a flower pot, right? And atzutz nakuv, even if it's got holes in it, even if it hasn't got holes in it, right? Fungi growing on pieces of wood, algae growing on rocks, we include all of this, okay? Why are you allowed then to eat grapes off a cluster on Shabbat? Because attachment is makam gudulo, it's detached, and therefore you are permitted to remove grapes from the cluster, even though it is still attached over there. Okay? Now, toll dose of coats there, page 15. Any act harvesting involving the object other than the actual stem is a tolder. For example, picking fruits or vegetables uh, with your hand or mouth, okay, or an unusual way of doing it. Harvesting dates by shaking a palm tree, harvesting olives doing that way. Okay, removing us. All these are toll dose, okay? And not the usual way of, of, of doing it is going to be problematic. Okay? Uh, let's get to Allah Lamaisa. There's a lot of stuff that isn't Allah Lamaisa. Okay, so including over here, walking on grass and plants, we said you can walk on grass. Okay, it's not your intention to dig it up. And it's not a secret, it's not definite. Running on grass is also going to be okay. Running through tall grass, it becomes a psig ratio. You're definitely going to pull something out of the ground. That's going to be uh, a problem. Okay. What is Kicking pollen-laden dandelions or right, is also going to be a, a problem when it comes to coats there as well. Yeah. Um, what, like, what about walking through wet grass that, like, more easily? No problem. Walking through wet grass, high heels even, not, is okay. We're not allowed to touch food from each other. That's a what? Like, I'm not allowed to give you food. You can give me food. But picking fruits or vegetables with one hand or mouth. From its makam gudulo, while it's still attached to the plant. From one hand. Using, using your hands or mouth to... So you're doing it in my legs. Unusual way. It's also a problem. It's probably not the right step, but it's forbidden. Even in an unusual way, that's a tolder. Okay? Okay. Fine, that's the basic halacha. Oh, we include into this, according to many opinions, even cutting nails and fingernails and toenails or removing fish from water. Now, you can feed your own fish on Shabbat because they are dependent upon you for the food. You cannot feed wild fish on Shabbat or Yom Tov. Those people who go and do tashlich by the water, throw bread into the water on Shoshana, are having sins right off the press. 
right? Tata bears, you cannot do that. You can only feed animals that are dependent upon you, domesticated animals that are dependent upon you for their food, okay? You cannot remove a fish from the water because you are removing it from its makam gadul, or it's a living thing. So taking a, wa- a fish out of the water on Shabbat would be prohibited. Wait, also, when I was moving, it does so what? Why is feeding the fish? Feeding the fish is okay. Oh, I thought that. No, that's you can feed, uh, but wild fish you cannot feed. Any animal what that is not, uh, nothing really. Ah. I just I mentioned over there. You can feed it, but you can't take it out. I just kind of just my ADD kicking in. Mm-hmm. It happens sometimes, Miss Cousins. You have to excuse me. Can you repeat what you said about Tashri? I'm just saying, doing, yeah. throwing bread into the water on Shabbat Yom Tov is actually forbidden. You cannot feed wild animals. Uh, on yourself as well. Okay. Um, that's taking off nails. Some say it comes from Goza, some say it comes from here, Kotzer. You're taking a something from a living animal that's yourself and cutting them yourself on Shabbat is forbidden. Even though it's a malacha, you don't actually need the nail itself, you don't need the hair that comes off. Right? So you can be lenient, we said, when it comes to, you know, and you cutting your uh, nails to go to the mikvah on Friday night, but we don't do it. Yeah. I always get asked this question. Sure, I yeah. always get asked this question, and I heard it as a kid as well. I never knew, and then I found the answer. Yeah. The Mishnah Bura says it is advisable not to cut one's nails on Thursday in preparation for Shabbat because it takes three days for the nails to begin growing. Right, that is a that is not halacha. That's uh, advice. He says you have no choice. It's fine. It was a minhag, it's, it's permitted, but he says not to. Fr- on Friday, it comes a mitzvah. There's a mitzvah to cut your nails, Erev Shabbos. That itself is a mitzvah. He advises on Thursday, because Thursday, three, three days before Shabbat. I actually saw the Mishnah Brura, because it's Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat. So one should try not to, but it's not halacha. It's not halacha. So Thursday night is fine then? Because it's fine. Yes. Um, what about Chad? You have like a paint nail or like We're going to come to that later when we get to. Um, uh, uh, when we get to um, uh, when we get to the, when it comes to cutting nails, when it comes to them. yeah, wow, yes, yeah, you can't do it. You can you can do it, but you can't throw the bread in. You can do tashlich after. We do tashlich between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, and we throw bread in. You can do tashlich, Rosh Hashanah. You just can't throw the bread into the water. It's interesting. Okay, let's finish this off. Let's talk about trees. Let's talk about sitting on trees or climbing trees. And let's talk about making a hammock or using a hammock on Shabbat. So when it comes to Kotzer, there were various gezero de Rabbanan the rabbis made. They said, you cannot, get ready for this one, you cannot climb a tree on Shabbat. If you did purposefully climb a tree on Shabbat, the rabbis made an unusual decree, that is, you got to stay in the tree till after Shabbat. <laughs> My advice to all of you is to not climb a tree knowing full well that it's Shabbat. If it's shogeg, meaning you didn't know it was Shabbat, or you didn't know it's forbidden on Shabbat, which now you do, you spend the rest of Shabbat up there. If it's very cold, you can get sick, you're permitted to descend from the tree, right? The challenge of the purpose was that you may come along and rip off a branch, which is the of Malacha of uh, of Kotzer. Okay, so that's when it comes to climbing trees on Shabbat. If you have a tree house at a tree, you cannot use that tree house on Shabbat. The rabbis added. I've got to add something else over here. The rabbis added uh, something else to this, and that is you cannot even use a tree. What we call mishdamesh Ilan. cannot even use the tree. Meaning, you want to hang a jacket on a tree. You want to hang, I don't know, a basket onto the branch on a tree. That is forbidden. Okay? You cannot even use a tree. Mishta Mesh Bilam is prohibited on Shabbat. Okay? What if it's not attached to the ground? A tree that is not attached to the ground? Like not like what if you're visiting someone and 
Like, like falls off. You just ask me if you've got a Christmas tree or you yeah, yeah, yeah. you got a Christmas tree in your house on Shabbos, you can start keeping Shabbos. That's the first thing. Uh, I would put that in the same category, and that is forbidden to be Mishdamesh with. Okay? okay. I guess. But why can't yeah. you do that? Because you're scared that it's not. So the problem is over there, you may come to break off a branch, forget it's Shabbat, break, break off a branch, and use it. Now, we don't really do that too much now. I mean, we pick fruit nowadays, for sure. We know it's about that as well. But even so, people in the old days especially used to rip off things in order to use as an item to hit an animal where they want to go, you know, riding, okay? That's actually the reason you cannot ride an animal on Shabbat. You may, after you may come along and take a switch, right? Take a piece of branch off a tree and use it for that as well. So climbing a tree is forbidden. Leaning heavily against a tree is forbidden. Shaking a tree, putting an object onto a tree, or even removing an object from a tree, right? Or even, even removing like a ball from the bushes would be uh, a problem. Touching a tree is actually not prohibited, if you want to know, okay? Because you're not actually making a use out of it. Okay. So the rabbis went even further. And the rabbis said so. So Mishnah for Ilan, Ilan itself, definitely. Using a tree is forbidden. Not only that, but using something which is connected to the tree is also forbidden. So, if I have a situation, drawing 101 with Rabbi Agio. If I have my tree, okay, and here's the tree itself, and I put a ladder on the side of the tree, you cannot use that ladder, okay? That's called stadim, right, or sides. Sides, these are called the Allahas. These are all rabbinic, by the way. This is all Gezeiro Rabbanan, right? The decrees of the rabbis, because the Atu, they want to keep you away from the tree itself, because dealing with Amalach. So they said, not only can't you use the tree, climb it for sure, touching it, using the branches or the leaves on it, right? But even something that's attached to it are called sdadim, right? From the word side, right? It comes from the Hebrew, side and sdadim, right? Side, sad. That's also prohibited. You can't even climb a ladder that's attached to a tree. You cannot um, use an item that is on the tree itself. Okay, for example, if there is a nail sticking out of a tree, you cannot hang your jacket and use that nail. That is prohibited, because it's attached to the tree itself. That's stadim. However, if you have a situation where something is attached to the attachment, that could be used. Something is attached to the attachment, that is called tzidei stadim, sides of sides. So sides is no. But today, stadim is okay. So, for example, if you were to have a nail in a tree, and on the nail is a basket, a zoi, that is connected to it, you can put things and take things in and out of that basket. That's far enough away. The rabbis wanted to make a certain distance, but people, in the old days, this was a big thing, people were living outdoors a lot more, I guess, they said, someone's attached to attachment that you could do. So if you were, for example, to have a jacket attached to a nail that's attached to a tree, you can take stuff in and out of the pocket of the jacket. Got it? But to use that nail or that ladder that's attached to it, that is not okay. So the question comes up, let's say a person wants to use a hammock on Shabbat. A what? A hammock. I have no idea how to say hammock in Hebrew. So I'm going to describe what it is and you can tell me what it is. H-A... Is a dictionary over there? H A M M O C K. What is it? What is it? Ansad. What's it called? Ansad. It's like the thing that you do. The thing that you do the thingy and it's the <laughs> So we have my two trees over here. One tree, two tree, okay? And I have to attach. So if the tamak is wrapped around the tree itself, right, you can't use that because it's attached. Something's attached to the tree. But if the hammock were attached to a nail, which is attached to the tree, then you could use the hammock. It's just the way it is. So that is not going to be a problem. Yes. 
No problem. Detach the rope, detach the tree, that's going to be okay. Um, you know those rubber tires that attach the rope, attach the tree, and kids hanging it? I think you can actually hang one of those, right? Is that right, yeah? Because it's the tire that's attached to the rope that's attached to the tree itself. So here it's a log, and the rope is on it now, it's attached to the tree. That is correct. Ta da! Okay, are you allowed to lie on the grass on Shabbat? Are you allowed to lie on the grass on Shabbat? No, but that's flat. stay there more than a second. Mm, I don't know. Definitely flatting it just while lying on it. Playing a game, I hear you're kicking around, you want it to be flat, just lying on the grass. Are you not using it? So the answer is you are allowed to do that. And the answer over there is because it is low. More, less than three amounts. Even a tree stump that is less than um, A three tefachim, three tefachim, three hands breadth, what was that? Four, eight, twelve inches, let's say, at the maximum, probably less than that. You can sit on such an exposed tree uh, root, sit on the grass, it's not a problem. They did not, the takana of the rabbis did not prohibit people from sitting on the grass. Right? It came to using a tree or somewhere things are grabbed from. So a dead tree stump that's kind of just like sitting there, using the grass, okay? is not going to be a problem. Why are you allowed to sit on the grass? You can even touch the grass. Right? You're a thought, no, it's a living plant. You can't touch, even touch a tree. It's a grass because it's low, okay? And um, What if you take it in grass, like if you do this? Like... That's, that's forbidden. So... But the rabbis didn't make, the rabbis weren't, for some reason they weren't nervous. You're just like lying on the grass, lying on the sit. So it's okay. Nervous, but you don't feel like that, and then you're gonna rip it, no? You're getting very from, Shani. What's happened to you? <laughs> You've gone, you've gone like crazy from me, like you're very much when it comes to the ground. Well, the rabbis weren't Baruch Hashem, okay? The rabbis weren't. Okay, that's why uh, we also cannot ride animals, we said. Okay, use of animals on Shabbat. Um, it disallows you from doing that. Riding an animal is okay. And that's actually nothing wrong in itself with riding an animal. Wait, like, is it, okay or not? it is not okay. We do not ride why? animals on Shabbat, okay? Because you may come to take a branch off the animal itself. What about a death? What? A death. What about it? That's a tree. That, that is made of a tree. It's made of wood. You walk on it. No problem. That's the, if you walk on grass, then you walk on the deck. The deck is disconnected. It's not makam gadulo. Uh, yeah. Um, can like a little kid ride your dog inside? <laughs> can a little dog, kid ride your dog yeah. inside? I mean... I assume it's not a chihuahua, you flatten it, it's probably, a, <laughs> yeah. probably okay, isn't it, dear? I don't see, I don't see. Ah, ooh, ah. It's muxa. Wait, okay, uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. People get, people get little... Animals? Some people are lenient on it. When I started teaching this, I, and this I get very scared to teach the halacha. I usually teach the last thing right before we leave, then I run out of the class, because people get very upset. Right? Not touching your parents on Shabbos, no problem. Not touching grandma, not, that's okay. Tell me not to touch my dog, I'll kill you. People get very affected by that for some reason, you know. Um, there is an aspect that we shouldn't touch our pets on Shabbos. It's tirchi yaseira. It's extra effort that goes into it. I have read those people who say nowadays gentle tapping, you know, to console the dog is permitted. But they jump on your lap. Jumping, jump on your lap. Right? Talking about petting, petting it. Why not? So. It's, it's called tirchei seira. You, you make it, you start getting involved in effort when it comes to using the animal itself. What effort? Like a malacha? Not a malacha. It's definitely not a malacha. Okay, let's move on. Uh, smelling fruit on a tree. Okay. Chazal prohibited. She looked at you, she wants your The look of death I get from people. I think people, you know, in our generation, but I have shot. Let me tell you something. You know what? I want to talk about dogs for a minute. So bear with me. I'm having I'm having a, a dog moment, and I grew up with a dog. I grew up with a dog. By the way, a nasty dog. By the way, a terrible personality. I'm, the only dog in the entire world is like a nasty dog. Um, if you want to get a good dog, by the get a Labrador. They're lovely. They're yeah. nice. Labs are the best. Uh, the, mm, nice chocolate lab. Anyway, in our generation, we've become obsessed with dogs. 
right? People have become close. It used to be people think they, they like their animals, but there's a sudden connection we will have. So here's my theory on this. Can I share my theory on this? Do you mind? I'm like whatever, I like. Um, we all sit in your class with as you drivel on and do your ranting. I think I mentioned actually this Shabbos to, to my friend who asked me about this. Dogs we know are Kelev. Kelev is Kolev, all heart. Man's best friend. They're very authentic, loving creatures. Okay, you come home, your cat's like, yeah, what do you want? I like get out of here, you know. But dogs always happy to see you. We live in a generation, I think, where people are very inauthentic. There's actually a Mishnah. And my Mashiach class talk about it. We're a very distant generation. People are not friendly. They're disconnected from each other, right? So people are lacking authentic relationships. Where's the only place to get? Is your dog? So people have given up on people, and they've started to having love relationships, like connect relationships with their dog, right? They start to prepare, prefer their dog to people because dogs are very real, authentic creatures. If they're upset, they show you. And if they walk over the front door, beep, 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 right? I come home, my daughter looks at me, yeah. I, where's my tree? You know, this is like, when kids are young, they're very happy. And then when they get older, they're very solemn, don't they? You know? So dogs are very, very real. So now we've actually started to, it just shows the decay of society that people aren't so like real and friendly and truthful. There's a lot of sheker, a lot of falsehood in the world, but a dog can always trust. So much of the chazal, even the rabbi, the Torah itself, says you can even reward dogs. Dogs have such a good trait, right? That you actually can throw a dog, the left or a korbanot, tishul kelev, the Torah says. We reward dogs. Also, dogs didn't bark when we left Mitzrayim, right? Kelev lo yecharis l'shono. Dogs didn't bark when we left Mitzrayim to give away that we were leaving. So we actually reward dogs. We actually see dogs as, as like good creatures, which is why all the other animals live in the barn, Right, they live outdoors, they're in the cold, and the dog, what does he do? And they help us, right? The cow gives his milk and his skin and his fur, and the goat gives his milk and cheese and wool. Right? And the dog, it was like, yip, 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 what does he do? He's just like, right, but he gets to be in the house, right? And he's at the table, and you give him your leftovers, you know, my little boo 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 boo, right? Like, my little schnooky mooky mooky, right? These dogs are very loyal. There's a tremendous amount of uh, truth and loyalty that comes with the dog. That's my Devatura. Doggy Devour Torah for 2016. Why people prefer dogs to their own family? Right? Hate your mother, but don't hate your dog, right? This is, like, this is what we've, we've got to uh, uh, in society. Um, okay, doggo, you have me two more minutes. Okay, smelling fruit. Chazal prohibited the act of smelling a tree because it may, a uh, fruit on a tree, because you may come to pick it. Okay, but scented plants, right, you can actually enjoy them without actually picking them, so that you can smell. So let's say you pass a myrtle bush, right? There's a very big bush, actually, a big, big bush. I, I walked to one in kibbutz. They, 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 uh, they had um, hadasim, hadas bush, very, very profitable. Um, so that you can actually smell on Shabbat, make a brach and smell it, because people don't, you can enjoy it without picking it. But actually taking a fruit and smelling it on Shabbat is prohibited because you may come to forget the Shabbat and uh, uh, pick it as well, okay? Wait. Yes? So a fragrance tree that has no fruit? Yes, that you can smell on Shabbat. You make a bracha and smell on Shabbat. Yes? Um, what if the fruit isn't ripe yet? Even so, we're careful not to do it. Even unripe fruit, I believe, we don't do. One second, let me think of anything else here. I think we're good. And of course, fruit that fell from a tree on Shabbat on Moksa and may not be handled on Shabbat Yom Tov until after Shabbat. How do you know it fell from Shabbat? If you know, if you know. You, don't, you basically don't gather fruit from the ground on Shabbat anyway, if you know for sure it fell off the tree. And we're done. Not too bad. Fabulous. See you all on uh, Thursday, God willing.